You're listening to the Million Acres Podcast. Our mission at Million Acres is to educate and empower investors to make great decisions and achieve real estate investing success. We provide regular content and perspective for everyone, from those just starting out to seasoned pros with decades of experience. At Million Acres, we work every day to help you demystify real estate investing. Hello, I'm Deidre Willard, an editor at Million Acres, and thank you so much for tuning into the Million Acres podcast. I would say that the number one question that our team at Mogul gets is about tax structures. And I find this interesting. I feel like they're more interested sometimes in taxes and avoiding taxes than the return on the investment. Taxes, I think, just loom large in our lives. But one of the great things about real estate is there are structures that can help. And one of them is DSTs, which is Delaware Statutory Trusts. We get a ton of questions on these. So if you've never heard of them or like me, you're just curious to learn more. So this is the podcast for you. My guest today is Shay Lappin of K K Properties. I'm going to read that one again. My guest today is Shay Lappin of K Properties. Welcome, Shay. Well, thank you for having me. We appreciate the opportunity to, to educate your listeners on the DST structure. Awesome. Well, let's not keep people waiting any longer. What exactly is a DST? Yeah, so there, there's a lot to unpack here, which I know we're going to dig in uh, through this, uh, this time we have together. But you know, in short, the DST, it's an entity. It's, it stands for Delaware Statutory Trust. And the reason why we utilize that structure, that entity uh, or wrapper that is around the real estate, similar to like an LLC or a partnership structure that owns the real estate, we use the DST because the IRS in the early 2000s has deemed the DST structure for like-kind uh, 1031 exchanges. Uh, so it's a big game changer for fractional ownership. The DST is primarily, in the real estate world, is primarily used uh, uh, to own a piece of real estate. So that's the unique thing uh, for our investors. Uh, we, I know we're going to dig into the different ways investors utilize them and the, the different um, types of investors that it works well for. But the biggest item here is the DST is ultimately utilized for that deferral of tax through the 1031 exchange. Why were DSTs created in the first place? You know, there was firms, institutional firms out there, mid-sized firms that were utilizing or trying to discover ways to make fractional ownership more friendly. I think the the old school way, and it still exists today, and we utilize it sometimes as a lot of people are familiar with the tenant in common structure or TIC or TICS as some people refer them to. Um, and although those can be really good for certain uh, types of business plans, there were also a lot of issues with that structure. So the DST uh, created, uh, most people would argue, just a smoother process, but it's the same idea as a tick in some regard that you're a fractional ownership uh, around it, um, but it's just a little smoother uh, of a process to invest. Interesting. So how is a 1031 DST different than a traditional 1031 exchange? In a lot of respects, it's very similar. So the way that they work, you know, as to, to speed people up that might be listening that aren't familiar with the 1031, uh, the 1031 exchange is utilized if you sell an investment property, in our case, or our specialization, um, sometimes a business, but primarily you sell an investment property, and you're going to face a potential high tax consequence. And that could be a combination of state and federal capital gains. Um, the big one, if you've owned your property for a very long time, could be depreciation recapture tax. And as you just mentioned on the intro here, uh, a lot of people are concerned about that tax, especially in today's world as potential taxes are continuing to rise or the talk about uh, raising capital gains. Uh, that's very important for people to continue to build their wealth. And that's across the board. It's not just for the ultra high net worth uh, investors. Uh, it's your everyday investor that can utilize the 1031 exchange. So the DST Mechanically, uh, when you sell your property, your money goes into a accommodator, a third party, uh, or a qualified intermediary, and they hold your funds. Uh, and you and that's where you then choose what to invest in. You could go invest in your own single family house. You could go buy a commercial property. 
Um, or you can consider what we do, which is the DST structure. Uh, but again, there's real estate inside of our DST structure, uh, which we can dig into that uh, here in a moment. Um, but mechanically, 1031 and the DST 1031 all have the same rules. There's not much difference there from that regard. So it sounds like people can use DSTs individually for properties, but then they could also use them as part of syndicated investment and fractional ownership? Correct. And that's the biggest difference, I, you know, to kind of wrap up your question, your previous question there is the, the DSC structure really allows for people to be a fractional ownership through that 1031 exchange mechanism. Um, your typical crowdfunding investment or your LLC or your general partnership or even REITs that exist out there, those can be all great investment vehicles, but those are utilized for cash investments. Those are after tax dollars or through your IRAs or retirement accounts that you guys or investors are investing through, but you can't sell your 12 unit apartment building or your commercial property and exchange into an LLC for the mo most of the time. So the DST structure, again, is just a wrapper around that real estate that allows people to be a fractional owner, but more importantly, outside of the fractional ownership, it allows investors in some cases to uh, especially in today's market, if you sell something for a couple million dollars and you want to get into some sort of quality property, it's competitive out there to find something. It's very difficult, even at the, those price points. Um, you might be getting into something very risky or value add. Um, and a lot of investors are at a point in their life where they want potential stability rather than taking a lot of risk. They already did that their entire investment career up to this point. So it allows investors to maybe get into some higher quality uh, institutionalized real estate, whether that's, you know, an Amazon distribution center, uh, 500 unit apartment building, stuff that you and I wouldn't be able to do on our own. Uh, and then secondly, diversify, you know, not over concentrate your 2 million, 10 million, $20 million into one asset, which I think has proven to work well over this past year and a half that we've all experienced of not being over-concentrated in one investment strategy or vehicle. Interesting, because we, through our mogul premium service, we've had a crowdfunding investment recently. It sold a little ahead of schedule. And one of the questions we got from our membership was, what do we do with this money? Can we 1031 exchange it? How do we avoid taxes? In a situation like that, can people take their money from something like that and then put it into a DST? So typically, no. Um, if it, and if I understood your question, if you are involved in some sort of fund over here, and and then there's a liquidity event, you know, a year later, two years later, whatever the time schedule is there, the fund itself, in some cases, can do a 1031 exchange internally and defer the taxes for the entire fund. Uh, dependent upon the structure, but the investors can't branch out on their own. So if they, you know, if it's a liquidity event where the fund distributes all that capital back to investors, unfortunately, you cannot defer through a 1031 exchange in most cases. Now there may be opportunity zones and things, other investment vehicles that I'm sure you explore on your podcast here. But for our stuff, it, it's got to be real estate to real estate, not part of a another syndication. Um, and sorry to make this long winded, but if a DST sells, a DST syndication sells in five years from now, those investors, because of the way it's structured, can do a 1031 exchange. And they could do a 1031 exchange into another set of DSTs, or they could decide at that point in time, hey, I want to go out and buy this property that I saw down the road uh, and do their own personal exchange. So it gives them that flexibility on, the, on that liquidity event. Interesting. Okay, so you can go from DST to DST, or you can go from DST to a traditional 1031. Exactly. And then a little more sophistication here, there has been a lot of sponsors that have come on to our platform in our, in our industry that are very large institutions that also have other verticals in their company, uh, for instance, REITs or non-traded REITs. And we're starting to see, uh, in some cases, certain DSTs have a business plan to do a 721 exchange or an up REIT into uh, that particular sponsor's REIT. 
And so that could be, you know, we do have investors sometimes approach us, hey, I want to get involved in REITs because that's the common, you know, no one knows what a DST is. They know what a REIT is and they want to be passive and they want to be a fractional owner. And, and there could be some estate planning purposes for going into the REIT um, and, and other potential benefits. So then that, in those cases, we can tailor uh, an investor's strategy to be involved in DSTs that are ultimately going to, they call it a 721 exchange, but it's very similar to a 1031 exchange where it moves into that REIT. And now you're part of, you have operating shares in that you know, big institutionalized REIT. Would that be a privately traded REIT or a uh, non-traded REIT? What would that be? It, it, honestly, it's it's across the board. You know, it could be public, it could be non-traded, privately, um, and and those are, uh, you know, there's pros and cons to all those different, and those are definitely high level that you want to really, as an investor, understand the pros and the cons, and talk with your CPA to uh, understand um, the the consequences of moving into the REIT versus just doing a traditional 1031 exchange. I would say 90% of people at this point continue to do a 1031 exchange and defer that tax because once you move into the REIT, you can never do a 1031 exchange again. If you liquidate your shares or there's a liquidity event, you will have a taxable um, event uh, outside of if the step up in basis still exists, your your heirs will get a step up in the REIT. But outside of that, if you know you want access to your capital for whatever reason, you're going to have a taxable event. Interesting, because I think one of the things that investors don't really understand sometimes is that idea that the 1031 exchange is sort of like this chain that you can keep doing really for the rest of your life. But once once you break that chain, then you would have to start a new chain, essentially. Yeah. And and, and there's big consequences if you've owned your property for a long time and it has appreciated significantly and and not just from the capital gains, but as I mentioned before, that depreciation recapture sometimes could be equally or as large as the capital gains. So we've seen some investors come to us and they've talked and you know spoke to their CPAs and they're looking at a 50 plus percent consequence if they don't exchange. Um, so the, the 1031 exchange really is an amazing tool uh, to build wealth for everybody, right? You know, our vehicle is for accredited investors, but the 1031 exchange itself is from, you could sell a $10,000 house and do a 1031 exchange and slowly build up your wealth. And in fact, a lot of our investors that are, you know, at that retirement age in their 70s to 80s, that's how they started. They have their five to $10 million now, but they started buying that $50,000 house or $100,000 fourplex and and use utilize that 1031 exchange to slowly uh, build that potential wealth for them. Interesting. Okay, you mentioned that you have to be an accredited investor on your platform. Do you have to be an accredited investor to use DSTs? Correct. Yeah. Right now, you know, there are some structures out there which I'm sure you're uh, aware of, where you could take non-accredited, but it's, it hasn't really bled into our industry yet. Um, we do hope that it does, um, or maybe the accreditation rules are uh, adjusted in, in the future to, to give more flexibility for, you know, sophisticated investors that might not be, quote unquote, accredited at this point. But um, currently, everything that I've ever seen in our industry has been for accredited investors within the DST world. It makes sense. What is the average minimum investment or what are you seeing on your platform? So the the minimum investments for most DSTs are $100,000, which is nice. Um, and that is flexible. You know, sometimes we do have high net worth. Uh, there's a lot of wealth, you know. I don't even know how much, but probably in the trillions of single family home owners, um, uh, investment properties that are part of that kind of baby boomer um, era. They, they own a ton of the real estate here. And we're starting to see those liquidate. Obviously, homes in certain areas of the country could be less than $100,000. So we can waive that minimum investment uh, for investors. Uh, I do believe the minimum investment's there just so that one DST doesn't have you know, 10,000 investors. Uh, it, it creates a, a more manageable experience for the sponsor. Um, and then on the other side, the reason why the minimums are lower, you know, these might be $30 million, $100, $200 million buildings 
and to have a minimum of investment of $100,000 also gives access, which we've seen a big popularity in, to cash investors. So just as someone may invest cash into a REIT or various funds out there, which are all great strategies, um, we're seeing investors invest in DSTs from a cash standpoint. And one of the reasons we, I believe, have seen that is because if you come in as a cash investor today, when it sells or that liquidity event, you can then do the 1031 exchange. Um, also, it acts and feels like real estate. So you're getting all those potential uh, benefits of ownership uh, as a cash investor on your Schedule E, just as if you owned real estate. So there's a potentially more you know, tax shelters for that income um, to shelter there. What kinds of investors are right for this? It sounds like for people who are retiring that that might be a good place for them. Also, it sounds like maybe people who have a, a cash event, maybe they cash in stocks or something like that. What kinds of investors are you seeing that are using DSTs? Yes. Yeah, so, so historically in our space, a large amount of the investors have been retirees or close to retirement, you know, 50 plus years old. Um, and that primarily, you know, up until about three to five years ago, was the investor. Rarely did we see someone on the younger end of the spectrum. And that's probably because, you know, if you're younger, you might have that time or that patience to be hands-on. And and when you're when you're your first, you know, real estate investment, it's nice to, you know, control it, right? It's hard to to make that first step of here's my hundred thousand um, dollars. But over the last five years, I think what has given people comfort maybe in those younger generation uh, or younger professionals is crowdfunding. I mean, we're not a crowdfunding, uh, but in a lot of uh, respects, we're very similar, right? We have a platform. Um, we're just not necessarily designated as a crowdfunding site or, or company, um, but the crowdfunding sites that are out there have really targeted the younger professionals, right? They have allowed those people to uh, learn about crowdfunding, learn about fractional ownership, which has then bled into our industry. And I think the biggest thing is uh, a lot of young professionals that are accredited investors in today's world, they're a, in a lot of cases uh, entrepreneurial. They have their hands uh, uh, and no capacity outside of what they're building, their entrepreneurial experience. And there's a lot of capital and wealth that's been built within that, those different entrepreneurial verticals that these DSTs have allowed um, those, those working professionals to get their money or their capital working within the real estate sector, um, just as if they were to go out and buy a 10-unit apartment building. Yeah, I agree that the 1031 exchange has always been a great way for people to build wealth. We've talked about it a lot on this podcast and on our site. There are concerns, though, about the Biden administration updating the 1031 exchange rules, changing, you know, changing different parts of it. Would that impact DSTs at all? From a high level, it's going to impact us in some respects the same way it's going to impact the rest of the, the world. Right. And that that would be do they take away the 1031 exchange or do they restrict it? And um, but in the long run, really, from what we've seen and full disclosure, no one really knows what direction the administration is going to go. We're all making educated guesses here. And, and there's, you know, been people inside the administration or, or uh, that have floated different ideas out there pre uh, administration and current, you know, as they've become the administration. Uh, and one of the, the main things that we've seen float around is not really necessarily taking away the 1031 exchange, but, either restricting the 1031 exchange in some capacity or restricting it for certain income earners. And that we've seen anywhere from a $400,000 ordinary income upwards to a million plus income that would be restricted in some ways. I, I believe there has been some floating around of, of how much tax you could defer a year through the 1031. I think that's more the recent one kind of similar to the primary residence, how you can, you know, if you're married, you could defer $500,000 of your gain. Um, when you sail, it sounds like they were kind of going down that road with the 1031. Now, fast forward into our space, that might 
uh, inhibit us uh, immediately, right? Because we're not going to get the $5 million exchanges. You know, people are going to hold on to their real estate. They're not going to pay the, the tax. It'll kind of freeze transactions, as we all probably know. But what I could see happening in the DST space is if they do restrict and they say, oh, you can only defer $500,000, for example, a year, why would you go out as a real estate investor and buy a $2 million building and take the chance that in 10 years from now, that's going to have more than $500,000 gain? Why not do take your $2 million and diversify it across different DSTs? And the chances, I mean, it could happen, but the chances of them all selling in the same year is going to be low. So you might insulate yourself on how much capital gain you're going to have each year. And maybe you only invest two fifty dollars or, or $500,000 max in each DST so that you know those. And if they do hit a home run and they have more than $500,000 of gain, then so be it. But that's where we see our space going if they were to do that. And I think that would be very beneficial for our world. That sounds like a smart strategy. All right, let's take a quick break here. Like what you're hearing? Get more real estate investing news and advice from Million Acres on Instagram at Million Acres and on Twitter at Million Acres underscore co. Some of our listeners are undoubtedly among the fortunate group sitting on piles of valuable tech stock. If you're one of them, listen up. Urban Catalyst could help you with your tax bill when it comes time to sell. Urban Catalyst is the premier qualified opportunity zone fund based in Silicon Valley. And if you meet investors' qualifications and invest in a qualified opportunity zone fund, you could potentially get big tax breaks. Here's how it works. When you go to sell your stock, you will likely generate a large capital gains tax bill, which means Uncle Sam may want to take a large chunk of it. If you're not keen on sending all that money to the U.S. Treasury, Opportunity Zone funds, like Urban Catalyst, can help you shield those gains. And Urban Catalyst isn't just any Opportunity Zone fund. Forbes Magazine and the Sorensen Impact Center ranked Urban Catalyst one of the top 20 OZ funds in the country. Don't wait too long. If you invest before the end of this year, you may not only defer capital gains taxes, but you also may be able to reduce your capital gains by 10%. And as an added incentive, if you hold your investment for 10 years, you will likely not have to pay any federal taxes at all on those gains. And it's not just stock sales. Capital gains from real estate sales, selling your business, or even a big crypto sale, these types of capital gains can all get potentially favorable tax treatment by investing in an Opportunity Zone fund. Urban Catalyst focuses on development in downtown San Jose, an area prime for growth and revitalization. You can learn more about the fund and the numerous development projects underway by visiting urbancatalyst.com backslash million acres. But keep an eye on your calendar. You only have 180 days after your capital gains event to invest in an Opportunity Zone program. So visit urbancatalyst.com backslash million acres today. I'm back with Shay Lappin, and we're talking about DSTs and 1031 exchanges. So let's talk about the properties on the K Properties website. I noticed there's a wide variety across different sectors. Is that for like-kind exchanges, or why is it in different sectors? Is it diversification? One of the biggest potential pros of the DST structure is diversification. And there's different diversification strategies. There's asset class diversification. There's geographic uh, diversification, even within certain asset classes, there's, you know, like a multifamily, you could be in a class A, or you could be, you know, in an ultra value add uh, situation, or you want to be in tertiary markets or primary markets. And so the DST on our platform, uh, with all the different sponsors that we utilize, they all kind of focus in different or have specializations in different areas of the country or different asset classes. I would say the core stuff that you'll see out there more frequently are going to be your kind of B plus a a plus multifamily. That's a big uh, sector on our platform, medical buildings, typically medical buildings with uh, large tenants, you know, these are either fortune 500 type tenants or very large regional operators, they're not your one off, you know, doctor's office or anything along those lines. Uh, industrial and self storage has become a big uh, sector uh, across, I think, in the entire real estate world for obvious reasons. Um, so we've done a lot of that. And then lastly, 
net lease properties, you know, you know, your typical, whether it's fast food or CVS is of the world, um, the triple net leases, which most people are re- referred to them as. Excellent. So are they mostly core stabilized? Is there any value add or opportunistic on there? So for, for most of our investors, 90% of the time, as I mentioned before, they're looking for stability. So uh, although there is risk in all the deals, right? No deal is perfect. Um, uh, but most of these on paper are considered to be, you know, somewhere on the fairway um, where uh, there might be some multifamily with some potential, maybe a B where it's maybe nine, 90s vintage class A or early 2000s where it needs a little updating, but they're not going in and wiping out all the tenants and, you know, restructuring the whole building. So I call that more of like a stabilized value add approach. Uh, but these are cash flowing assets. Uh, day one, rents can go up and down. Um, there, I, I think that there could be sponsors as the space evolves and as the spectrum of investors are coming to the table. Because as I mentioned, we're getting a lot more younger people who maybe have a higher risk profile. Maybe there will be some stuff in the future that has more of that value add play. Interesting. So you're not dealing with things like tax losses because you're redeveloping and there's no, you know, no, no tenant base or something like that. Now we have funds outside. We do a couple of real estate funds that might have more of that, but that's not for the DST structure. Um, the closest thing that I've seen in that is sometimes, you know, a brand new construction building may have some sort of tax benefit to it, whether like there was a recent offering where I think it was like the first four years uh, there was no property tax because it, the developer that originally developed it had some incentive to develop there from the city. Um, so stuff like that, but very light. You know, this this vehicle really is utilized to again defer that that capital gain and 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 uh, continue to cash flow along the way potentially. That makes sense. So in real estate crowdfunding and the deals that I've seen on those platforms, they're usually uh, LPs, limited partners, uh, or or you see fractional that are in LLCs. How is that different than uh, the DST structure? Yeah, so the DST structure, um, in some respects, uh, I, I like to compare it to like a family living trust, right? If if we have, I have a family trust and my real estate is inside my trust. If I went and pulled title on my home or an investment property, it would show at the, the, the city that, you know, Shay's family living trust owns that asset. And then, so I, as Shay, am not the owner, but I'm a beneficial owner of my trust, right? I get that. It's a pass-through entity. And so the DST structure is very similar where, you go say it's an Amazon distribution center, you go pull title on that asset and it's a DST, you're going to see the entity of that DST. And then they're depending upon how many investors there are, but let's say there's 40, there's 40 undivided uh, interest, right? There may be someone owns 10%, someone owns 12. There's no GP LP structure. Everybody is an undivided interest. No one has more power than the other. Um, but the sponsor is the trustee of that. So it'd be like if I had my family trust and I told, asked you to be my trustee, so you make all the decisions, but I'm the owner of the properties, right? Um, same, same concept. The sponsor makes those day-to-day decisions. That's why it's a passive investment. Um, and that's what a lot of people are looking for when they're investing in this. Um, uh, but ultimately, it's it's uh, everything from you know net operating income to potential appreciation. There's no waterfalls. That's I think the biggest thing on the back end is there's no preferred return or waterfall structure. That's why the IRS had blessed it as like kind because it doesn't feel or act like a general partnership. If that makes sense, that does make sense, and that's a big difference between a lot of the crowdfunding deals that we've seen that have that have that kind of structure. Correct. And I, I do like to say it's not that the crowdfunding types of investments are bad by any means. It's just a different strategy um, in, in our world. Exactly. So in terms of communication, one of the things that we think about with real estate crowdfunding is you get a lot of communication from the sponsors. You get updates on things like that. 
What kind of communication inside a DST does that sponsor trustee have with the investors? There's a couple layers there. You know, our firm, we do have an investor relations team that that acts as an interface for investors. Because again, sometimes an investor may come with, uh, you know, we've done exchanges upward of 50 to $100 million, right? And they're diversifying across 20, 30 deals. And that might be across 10, 15 different sponsors. So at K Properties, we do have uh, a team here that you investors can utilize to get updates on their projects. But from a sponsor's responsibility, uh, depending upon the type of asset, right? If it's a multifamily deal, there's probably going to be more frequent updates, right? You know, some cases on a monthly basis, if not at least on a quarterly basis where, you know, Joe moved in, Sally moved out and, you know, we paid all these bills, this deferred maintenance issue came up. Uh, you get full transparency there. Um, if it's something like an Amazon, you're probably just going to get a quarterly report unless something comes up uh, that that would uh, need to be communicated to the investors. Um, and then with all that said, with technology in today's world, we're seeing all the sponsors create you know portals and things like that so investors can just kind of log in and get live updates. So yeah, it's very, in my opinion, transparent, accessible, um, through not only our firm, but, you know, the different sponsors we work with. Awesome. So looking at the properties on your website, you've got interest in a lot of the same sectors that we recommend and invest in when we're talking about REITs. You mentioned multifamily, essential service shopping centers, those triple net lease properties, healthcare. Is there any sector that you're seeing, you know, putting more, more time and investment into? And what are you seeing on a geographic basis as well? So geographically, you know, it's all the same that you're hearing out in the, the media, the, the Southeast, right? That Sun Belt, the Texas through Florida, up through the Carolinas. And it's not to say we don't have other stuff throughout the country, um, but that's really where everybody at our level uh, professionally has seen growth and still potential growth in those markets. Um, you know, some markets, the Dallas's of the world are starting to get pretty uh, frothy out there and it's harder to find uh assets or Austin. Um, but the Southeast, I think, is where about 80% of what we do, uh, even pre this expansion that's taken place. I mean, you can't came in our industry 15 years ago, they were targeting that. And I think that's why DSTs, fortunately, did really well through this coronavirus, because uh, by default, most of the investments were in the Southeast. Um, and a lot of those areas uh, didn't shut down fully, or they had different uh, waves of shutdown. So it allowed those economies to be, you know, a little bit more stable potentially than maybe like a Los Angeles or something. Um, uh, and then in terms of, of, uh, what's popular out there, uh, I mean, a lot of investors, uh, and stability in that B plus a multifamily, you know, our, our rent collections across the board. And we probably are actively invested in 10 plus billion dollars of multifamily with our investors. And uh, the rent collections were 90 plus percent across those B plus A, where nationally, I think at one point, some agency released that there was only like a 70% rent collection or 74 or something along those lines. So I think that there's a flight to quality within those those uh, class A or B plus assets in the multifamily sector. And then your traditional long term net lease is just like we saw in the recession in 08. Uh, as long as your company didn't go bankrupt, you had no cash flow interruptions. Right. And, and the key there is targeting investment grade tenants. You know, don't go for Bob's hamburger and try to get an eight cap. And then they're the first to go, right, when a, when a correction happens. So uh, we've seen a, a flight to quality in that, like I said, that multifamily and a flight to quality in long-term investment-grade tenants. Uh, and then lastly, as I mentioned, that industrial-type property and self-storage has been become quite popular over the last two to three years. Oh, yeah, incredibly so. How are you getting uh, assets and sponsors onto your platform? You know, our founder, Dwight K really was one of the first – groups uh to to create a company that this is the focus the dst structure a lot of people in an, uh, that do the dsts uh they might have a couple sponsors but it's more financial planning or investment advisors not to say that that's bad but at, because of their focus you know they're doing all sorts of uh, financial vehicles 
they may only have a certain amount of man and woman power to get out there and talk to sponsors and get access to deals. Uh, where Dwight K, our founder, you know, because of our specialization, this is all we focus on. You know, we ultimately review almost every single DST for many institution that comes out, and and really we get approached at this point because we are one of the largest equity raisers uh, in the space. You know, we're on track to. I think this year raised a little over half a billion dollars of equity uh, through our, our platform. Last year, we were close to half a billion. We were 430 or 50 or something along those lines. Um, so we're fortunate to at least get a stab at reviewing. It doesn't mean we approve everything, um, but we get a stab at you know getting access to the deals for our investors. Well, let's talk a little bit about that approval process. What does what your due diligence process look like? Yeah, so there's different layers of, of due diligence. You know, obviously the sponsor is doing their they're buying that property and they're doing all of their their due diligence. And if there's a loan on the property, they're putting you know their name on that loan. And that's one of the nice things of uh, that we didn't hit on here with the DST structure is if an investor wants debt for a tax purpose or they need debt because sometimes in a 1031 exchange you need to replace debt, uh, the DSTs have non-recourse financing uh, on them. So obviously your your principal investment's at risk. You could lose that, but you don't have to sign on the loan docs. The sponsor is. You don't have to go through the lengthy process of getting approved for the loan um, because the sponsor already originated that loan on the property. And so uh, it, it, it really creates uh, a neat vehicle for debt. But to get back to your question, due diligence, you know, the sponsors doing A to Z, they ultimately submit a package to us. This is everything we did. And the nice thing is we get to see it all up front, right? When you are buying your own property and you're on a tight time frame, it may take you four, four weeks to get an environmental report or a property condition report. Um, and you may be up against the wall and having to make a tough decision without getting all your due diligence. We get all that because the sponsor did it. Um, and then we, we have a staff here um, outside of all of our executives here that do have experience, we have a dedicated staff that goes through all the third party reports, goes through market data. We actually send somebody out to all the assets, um, and we'll provide that report to our investors. Uh, because sometimes it's nice to see the iPhone pictures of a building rather than the glossy brochure, right? You can make anything look good and not that a building that's not as pretty as bad, but investors, I think, appreciate that. Um, and then lastly, I think that uh, uh, if you have the capabilities and the time, we always encourage investors that we'll take them out on property tours. That may be difficult, right, if you're having to travel in today's world across the, the United States. But um, but that's kind of the process. And then, you know, why does a deal get uh, not approved? It could be a, an asset class that we're just not comfortable with. So there's some very respectable sponsors that we work with but if they come out and this sounds obvious today but this was our our strategy you know five years ago with a hotel deal we just don't touch hotels um, we also don't touch senior care assisted living and and that's mainly because assisted living has a large litigation risk it's got most of the times they're smaller operations. It, there's very few big national operators. So you don't have that credit quality on the lease. Um, and we've just seen a lot of those lose money now from a development standpoint or maybe in a REIT or a fund where you're ultra diversified, the assisted living care may make sense. Um, but asset class rejection is a big one on ours. And then how is the deal structured? And that is primarily in a lot of cases tied to the financing, right? Does it have short-term financing? What's the debt coverage ratios? All the above. Uh, I want to go back to a term you mentioned before, because I think it's important for people to understand, which is non-recourse financing. Can you explain exactly what that means? Yeah. So non-recourse financing ultimately means that uh, the bank can't come after you outside of your investment. So if for whatever reason, they're going to do a foreclosure and it was a $50 million building and it's only worth $10 million. So the bank's not even going to be able to collect their money. If there was recourse financing on that, you might have had to collateralize your primary residence or other investment uh, properties. In these, it's 100% non-recourse. Um, any carve-outs that are required, sometimes banks might have a 
carve out, they call it, where it might be like an environmental carve out or a bad boy act carve out, which typically means if you don't pay the mortgage, who do we go after? Uh, and the sponsor signs those carve outs. So even the little exposure there, there is the sponsor is taking all that risk, that institution. Um, so again, to wrap it up, the, the non recourse financing really is defined that you, only your money is at risk that you invested. Great. Thank you. Okay. So you mentioned tours earlier. What else is involved in your education process for investors? Education is huge. You know, we, we put a lot of effort into education over the years from providing tons of resources now all digitally done, you know, on our website, great blogs, case studies. Um, we really encourage, it's been difficult over this last year, but we, you know, I used to travel prior to coronavirus almost every week to meet with investors across the country. Uh, we're fortunate now to have offices throughout the country. So it's really made it accessible for investors to get in front of one of our representatives. We could literally probably get to anybody within a two hour range from all of our offices across the country. Just your education of DST, it's a new structure. You know, all the ins and outs, a lot of what we discussed. Um, that's one whole segment that usually takes a good amount of time to get someone comfortable with. Um, and then number two, then it's diving into that real estate, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, although you're investing in a DST, you're really investing in the underlying real estate. And we have been very uh, lucky, and I don't know if that's the right term, but fortunate to have a great team behind us from all different sectors of real estate, you know. Betty Fryan and our team with 30 plus years that she worked at different uh, real estate firms and Jason Salmon. And, and so that experience that we compile together, again, I think what sets us apart, because a lot of people that offer DSTs outside of the sponsors, they're obviously educated, but the sponsor is not interfacing with the client. It's the, it's the advisor. And we are truly a real estate backed in, uh, advisory firm. We're not, you know, a finance, I couldn't sell you, I could sell you stocks, but I wouldn't be the right person to, to do that. So how long are the types of holds on the, these investments and what sort of returns are people seeing? I would say they all kind of range between a five to 10 year hold, you know, full disclosure that the sponsor does have the flexibility if they want to hold something longer for X reason, they do have that ability or vice versa. If they want to sell, for a particular reason that was earlier, maybe in year four, when we thought it was going to be a seven year hold period, they can do that. But typically, I think it, I think there was a consulting agency that looked at all the, a couple of years ago, all the DSTs that went full cycle or had a liquidity event, the average hold period was around like a five to seven year hold period. Um, you know, returns, they, they range uh, just like any real estate strat investing strategy or asset class. Um, you know, there's from a cash flow perspective and, and cash flows, like I said, could go up and down dependent upon, you know, the, the tenants. Um, but those could be anywhere from four to, you know, 7% cash flows dependent upon the, the real estate. And then the, the overall IRRs, you know, that's a big range as well. But I think on average, you know, eight to to 20%. Those higher ones, we've definitely seen higher IRRs in today's market, but I don't always like to quote those because I think we're obviously at a unique place that I don't know that it's going to sustain that going forward. I think right now what's important for investors is putting themselves in a defensive position. And that's not chasing yield. It's not chasing the big, uh, you know, quote unquote IRRs. None of us know what's going to happen in five to seven years. No one even knew that this was going to happen, what's happening today. And, um, and diversification, that's how, what you need to do in our opinion um, when we're at this kind of 07 moment, right? The, what's going to happen? Yeah, I, I do think we are in this this moment. Those are some impressive cash flows, though. So, yeah, we're in this weird moment. Uh, last year, deal flow kind of seemed to stop across a lot of different uh, platforms. This year has been crazy on, on the REIT side. We've had joint ventures, mergers, acquisitions, all kinds of stuff happening. How active is the deal flow on your side? So it's pretty active. I mean, at any given time, probably in our in the whole DST world, we pray, we stay pretty close with some consulting firms that kind of measure out the the different um, uh, 
uh, or some private firms that work just within our space with the, the advisory firms. And there's probably around 40 to 60 offerings at any given time right now. On our platform, once we kind of go through those approvals, not approvals, we are averaging maybe around plus or minus 40 offerings. And that's across 30 plus uh, sponsors. I think sponsors in today's world are having, you know, just like all of us, it's you're having a hard time keeping inventory, right? The market's moving so fast. You bring out, I've seen $100 million equity raises be gone in a month, right? Where two years ago, it would have taken three to six months to, to raise that capital. And, and then in terms of the growth in our industry and that potential growth in different, um, I was listening to your podcast with, uh, on crowdfunding and, and he was mentioning, you know, the different institutions that are shifting to retail investors, right? And that's happening in our world too. The big institutions uh, are eyeing the DST world and they're eyeing that world for what I brought up earlier, that, uh, that REIT. At all the big institutions, the REITs are the big thing right now, right? Growing their REITs, growing their asset management, uh, assets under management. And with DSTs, you can bring that capital into REITs. And so some of the bigger players, the bigger institutions, they realize, oh, we can get access to retail fast capital. Fast capital is 1031 exchange funds. You know, you have to make a move. If you're a cash investor, you don't have to make a move, right? You, you can be more patient with your investments. And so I think our industry is going to, you know, outside of uncontrollable events, is going to continue to substantially grow. All right, last question for you, Shay. You've got a past as an Olympic athlete. We've seen so many professional athletes become really smart real estate uh, investors from, you know, Roger Staubach back in the day to Emmett Smith, Alex Rodriguez. What lessons do you think from elite sports kind of translate to real estate investing? The reason I got exposed to real estate was because of my sports uh, experiences. And one of the things is, you know, I, I played water polo. That's what I went to the Olympics for. And unfortunately, in our world, we don't make millions of dollars. You know, we actually lose money by playing the sport, right? We don't make any money. And so uh, you had to be creative. If you weren't in college, uh, you had in order to train and to live and to feed yourself, you, you had to be creative. And, and real estate provided that for me. You know, I was lucky to have some great mentors that I seeked, you know, through college. I actually got into to real estate and I got a job. I got my licenses in college because... I had a great mentor on the Olympic team when I was in college uh, that went to Stanford and, and he had pulled me aside at, at one point. I was like, hey, don't get stuck in the sports world. Don't retire at 35, 40 years old playing professional sports and not have anything to do. And that, you know, kind of put a light, light bulb in my head and I s seeked out, you know, different industries that would give me flexibility to play my sport and achieve my goals which that discipline obviously carries over into the real estate world and, and being able to manage the capacity that we, we operate at. But uh, really, that's how I was exposed is I worked my entire water polo career in some capacity. And that really has played into some of the expertise I have today because I took jobs as, as little as being an on-site property manager so that I could have free housing while I trained. And so I learned you know, interacting with tenants, you know, all the maintenance, all the property management, then went to asset management, then went to brokerage, then went to syndication. So, you know, it really gave me a really good base to uh, uh, be at the level I'm at right now. I'm very fortunate to, to be at a company and lead a company that is the size we are at the, at the age I am. But all that experience that that I gained is ultimately what got me here. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was great. Uh, reminder to listeners, you can learn more and check out the properties at kpi1031.com. You can always email us at media at millionacres.com to share your thoughts. Stay well and stay invested. Thank you for tuning in to the Million Acres podcast. I hope you liked today's show. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing through your favorite podcast provider. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop us a line at help at millionacres.com. Stay well and stay invested.
People on this program may have an interest in the deals, offerings, or services they discuss that Million Acres or The Motley Fool may have a formal recommendation for or against. Always consult a certified tax professional before acting on tax advice, and do not buy or sell assets based solely on what you hear. 